or continuous action space like linear Gaussian systems. The discussion, our discussions covers wood. There is a uh, online repository, the crash, uh, crash course on reinforcement learning in GitHub. They have uh, uh, published the Python code along with the one MATLAB code where the control system is uh, control system problem is done. So outline of the paper, the introductions, then what they discuss, what is reinforcement learning, then the Markov decision process, which is actually the mathematical background of the reinforcement learning. Then three methods they have discussed, policy gradient, uh, queue learning and model building system identification, adaptive control, and the appendix they have given the um, Python code for solution of two, two problems. Interactions, reinforcement learning concerned with the intelligent, intelligent decision-making in complex environment in order to maximize some notion of rewards. The model of the system is unknown and the aim is to learn how to react with the system to optimize the performance. Reinforcement learning is studied in many fields like control theory, multi-agent systems. Reinforcement learning have shown an impressive results, performance results in playing Atari games, robotics, control of continuous system, and distributed control of multi-agent systems. Uh, model of the system is unknown, and the aim of the aim of reinforcement learning is learned how to react with the system to optimize some performance. The system may be a discrete system, has finite number of actions, for example, the card pool systems, which has a plus one and minus one actions, and a continuous space has infinite number of action space. For example, a linear quadratic controls. What is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is concerned with the decision making problems. In reinforcement learning, the data are dynamics. In case of supervised or unsupervised learning, the data are statics. What is the dynamic meaning? The, the meaning of dynamic is the data is generated by the system, and the new data depends upon the previous actions of the systems. Uh, the definition given by Soton and Bernd Flo, the finding a suitable actions to take in a given situation in order to maximize some reward. So we'll discuss what is the reward and this figure, how it is happening. So the, the process of reinforcement learning, it starts with the agents. The agents select actions and apply to the environments. As a result of these actions, the environment changes and reveal a new states as representative of the internal behavior. The environment revealed a reward, which quantifies how good is, was the action given by the states. The agent receives, receives the states and reward and tries to select the better actions to maximize total reward in futures. This loop continues until the, uh, the final states receives. Now discuss each and every component of this diagram. So first, let's discuss the environment. Environment is a dynamic system which produces the data. For example, these are robots, linear and nonlinear dynamic systems in the control theory technology, the games like Atari and Go. The environment receives the actions as an input and generate the variables, which are the states actually, and based on its own rule. Some rules are there that we will discuss in the later part of the discussions. The rules govern the dynamic model and it is assumed to be unknown. An environment is usually represented by a Markov, Markov decision process. Next is the rewards. What is reward? Along with each state pair, the environment reveals the rewards, RT. The rewards is a scalar measure that shows how good was the action taken by the state. In RL, aim to maximize some notion of the rewards. The example, total rewards, uh, where the gamma lies between zero to one, is a discount or a forgetting factors. Total reward is a summation of uh, gamma and the uh, rewards. The trajectory we'll discuss, this is actually the total number of time steps it considers. Component of RL, agents and agent components. And, and RL agents can have maximum of three components, but it need not to necessarily all the components, mini, minimum one is required. What are the components? one policy, one policy policy function and a model. The policy is the agent's rule to select actions in the given states. So a policy maps from the states to the actions. Uh, there is like common terminology that agents and policy are intensively used, but conceptually they are not correct. The fellow functions, it quantifies performance of a given policy. It quantifies the expected total rewards if we start in a state and always act according to the policy. 
models the mo agents intervention of the environment environments so based on the uh, based on the main components rdl agents built up of three parts the policy policy gradients built upon defining defining a policy for the agents dynamic programming based on solutions required estimate value, value functions model building approach try to estimate the model of the environment markov decision process is a mathematical form, framework for modeling decision making process markov decision process are commonly used to desc describe dynamic states and represent environment in the reinforcement learning framework it is a tuple of five components of states a state describe the internal state of the markov decision process if s represents the states and ml we have a finite number of states then denotes the number of states otherwise if it is mlp are continuous so it, it will have multi infinite numbers so nlp denotes the dimension of the state vector for each states as visited in the uh, markov decision process a boolean variable is considered which is always false except in the final states or where mlp need to be restarted again actions actions are a possible choice in each states if there is no choice at all to make then the markov process markov decision process become markov process and actions represent the set of actions if mlp has a finite number so denotes the number of actions if it is a continuous action space denotes the dimension of the actions in reinforcement learning uh, the solutions depend upon whether it is uh, action has a finite number or a infinite numbers so all the discussion be further discussions depends upon uh, whether they are uh, having a finite number of actions or a continuous action space transition probability the transition probability describes the dynamics of the markov decision process it shows a transition probability from all the states to a successive states as this for its actions so p is the set of transition probability with n a number of matrix uh, dimension to tell states and uh, its entry of this matrix is given by probability of the next time steps uh, states equal to the ne next states with the condition of the previous time steps at uh, its action space next is the reward the immediate reward or the rewards in short is masses measure of the how good is the actions taken by the states and is represented by the uh, expectation of the rewards and t is the index of the time expected in calculation of what are possible rewards r represents set of immediate rewards associated with all state actions pairs the total rewards is defined as a summation of uh, a discount factor and the rewards if it is assumed that rewards is deterministic throughout except one examples where it is considered as a stochastic process so the the expectation is not actually uh, involved discount factor this discount factor is lies between 0 to 1 and it's quantify how we can care about the immediate reward and the futures if if discount factor is 0 we only care about the current reward not and not what we do will be in the future if it is towards one we care all reverse equally the discount factor might be given or we might select for ourselves in the early process usually uh, this is actually okay. uh, can, the discount factor is considered close to one uh, the discount factor is equal to one in two cases there exists a uh, observing state in the markov decision process such as it the markov is markov decision process is observing state it will never move from the, the last stage basically it stop the process and we care about the average cost that is when the average of the energy consumed in the robotic systems in that case we can define the average cost as a summation where t, t tends to infinity let us do a numerical example of the market decision process so here we have three states as s0 s1 and s2 with each states having two actions s0 and a1 and uh, this orange mark uh, arrow shows the what is the reward for its its of the actions so with a probability of 0.1 uh, from here a0 to a0 of action space to as s1 it is minus one of the reward 
then point, point 0.7 of probability this is the line point 0.7 for is the reward of plus 5 and with point 2 which reward of point uh, plus 5 it goes to s2 so total reward in the states is given by the expectation of rewards from states to x uh, state and actions so point 0.1 into minus 1 that this is the reward point 0.7 point 0.5 point 0.2 in this total expectation is point 4.4 .4. if we consider the total for each action pair and the states so three states so this is a matrix of three by three for two action pair so two 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 different matrices uh, here we can see that the if we add the, the rows it becomes all row summations are one because the probability total probability is one now revisiting the as component one more time after defining the mark of decision process so policy essence rule to select action in a given states the policy maps from the states to actions deterministic policies have a rule with constant value in stochastic policy the it's given by the probability functions value function the value functions quantify the performance of a given policy in the states and this the how the value functions are given model the model essence model interpretation of the environment is given by the probability which we just discuss, discuss which might be different from the two fellows hey, kamal can i ask a question yes sorry let me turn my video on but um if you go back to your slide number 15 uh, you showed like a reward is minus one plus five and plus five um, yeah. Is there a process for choosing those numbers or is that just like based on? No, no, this is randomly they have given actually. Okay. So you uh, is that arbitrary or there's a process? It's arbitrary. Uh, they have not discussed the, regarding this, but it, one st statement gave that this. Uh, no, this is arbitrary they have done. Okay. Thank you. The policy again the most ambitious method for solving of reinforcement learning problem is directly learn the policy from the optimization of the total rewards in this case we do not build the model of the environment and we do not appeal to the boltzmann's equations modeling assumptions is in consideration of parameter parametric probability density functions for the policy and we aim to learn the parameter to maximize the expectation expectation of the total total rewards so this is the formula Policy gradient, the directly optimize the policy by gradient approach, the gradient of Z with respect to the parameters. The algorithm that optimize the policy is to call the policy gradients. Uh, with this uh, formula, the uh, gradient of log of P, uh, we can find the gradient of uh, gradient is equal to this formula. Uh, so why stochastic policy gradient when the policy optimal policy more Markov decision process is optim uh, deterministic in policy gradient no value functions and no model fun model of the dynamic is built so only way to evaluate the policy is to derivate deviate from it and see how it how see the rewards so the burden of the optimization is shifted onto sampling the policy by perturbating the policy and observing the results, we can improve the policy measurement. If we consider a deterministic policy policy for policy gradient, the SN trapped in the local minima. The reason is that the, that, that, that the SN has no way to examining other possible actions. And furthermore, there is no value functions to show how good the, cur the current policy is. Considering the stochastic policy th does become essential. So in case of discrete action space, how to calculate the policy gradient? So PDF of uh, the PDF of pi, pi theta maps from the states to the probability of each actions. If there is an actions and the policy network has any outputs, it represents the probability of the action space. So this diagram shows how it is done. In for example, an example of the network produces the probability of the uh, probability maps. The network generates the PDF of three possible actions taken by the states as the output. P1 is the probability of the action A1, P2 is the action A2, and P3 is the action A3. So the network's the input to the network is the states, and its, its output is the probability of the actions with A1, A2, and A3. 
uh, in case of continuous space when the action space is continuous select a pdf by phi theta as a diagonal uh, gaussian uh, distributions where the main uh, mean is the parameter is and the covariance is selected as the uh, identity matrix with uh, two times of standard division square so model assumption is the mean of the pdf and the part that build our policies the actions taken action then taken from the samples from this uh, distributions for example a linear policy can be represented with the phi theta with the mean uh, the mean as a mean mean with the uh, with the parameters where theta is a linear gain and the actions are taken as from the sample of the uh, uh, normal distribution with with theta s and the, this, the standard divisions defining the probability of the trajectory one of the parameter parametric pdf of the policy is defined the next steps is to sample the actions from the pdf and generate a trajectory a trajectory is and the trajectory of the environment is generated by sampling actions from the probability density functions for a state s1 with initial state of the environment the procedure is select action space action a0 with the pdf with a0 to a0 taken from the uh, probability density function deviate the variable using as a1 environment the environment reveal the reward r1 and the transition to a new states of s2 next consider the new action space a2 and the pdf that is from the a2 taken from the uh, probability density function deviate the environment to s2 and the environment reveal the reward of s r2 which and goes to the transition state of s3 this process is repeated for the total time time steps and the end of the time step we get the trajectory uh, given by these sets the probability of the trajectory uh, is defined by the uh, product of all the probabilities policy and defining the now in case of discrete action space if the action space are discrete the network the network is a state and denotes the probability density functions it is a factor with however many entries as the action space and the actions are indicated indices from the factors so probability of at with respect to theta is uh, is obtained by indexing into the output of the networks in case of continuous action space uh, the uh, continuous expenses we consider a multivariate gaussian uh, with a mean value is equal to the networks and then we take a, a probability value from the probability distribution functions now the calculations of the gradients so uh, gradient calculations so this is the first equation now the replacing with the expectation with the integration integrations then bringing back the integrations outside and bringing the de derivative to in insights then the previously we considered a log derivative trick so these equations come and then again replacing the integration with the expectations and the final equations becomes this the last equations of the gradients competition of for the gradient as a discrete action space this action space cases it's quite simple because it can be built a cost function in the machine learning library this is the function of the uh, functions to be maximized the weight entropy cost functions which is actually optimized the, the, the optimized in the classic classification tasks the aim is to the this first equation is actually uh, maximize of the rewards the in the second equations we minimize because there is a negative signs so this actually the terms for which this term definition of these terms in case of continuous expansion space from the previous uh, from previous for continuous expansion space the uh, the the derivative of the log of probability is given by this formula and to evaluate the gradient we sample the d trajectories from and replace the expectation with the average of the trajectories so this equation will be given. for example if a linear policy uh, mu, th mu theta will become a 
parameter of the th theta is associated with the total uh, to total become the the uh, the derivative of the uh, cost function uh, the functions so finally so how poly, uh, policy gradient as a algorithm sample from the trajectory from the environment are collected as a data for polynomial uh, policy gradient by following that step step initialize the empty history of the states x states x on and the reward observe the states s and the sample the exon from exons from the policy with the from the pdfs deviate the environment using the actions and observe the rewards add this re add the reward add the states action and the reward to the history batch actions states action and reward continue from two to six until the episode ends now how to improve the improve the policy in these steps calculate the total reward and optimize the parameters policy so improving the policy gradient uh, policy gradient is elegant algorithm however it does not always produce a good result and sometimes it doesn't produce any results so many approaches to improve the policy gradient reward to go consider the considering the below expression instead of the total total reward and the reason is that the reward obtained from before the time so initially it was starting from the initial first time to the total time now it is come from the not from the 11 of the previous time stamp action from the times and the gradient is calculated uh, this way the second approach to substitute a baseline b so from the uh, from the total uh, reward now the b is b is uh, substituted the justification is that the, if we subtract a constant from an objective functions in an optimization problem the minimization argument does not change this substitution baseline in uh, policy gradient act as a standardization of the optimized optimal problem and can be accelerated up computations uh, there are many uh, choice of uh, baseline functions and this paper discusses the how to how to consider the baseline functions now second method is q learning another possible approach to solve reinforcement learning problems is in the dynamics programming dynamic programming and associated to boltzmann's principle of optimality the most popular dynamic programming approach is the q learning which relies on the definition of quality functions the quality of the q function is equal to the expected rewards for taking an arbitrary actions a and then follow the policy in this sense the q functions quantify the performance of the policy in each state's actions pair so this is the q functions where uh, the policy uh, pi is the action max actions maximize the expected reward starting from the states if we consider the cost uh, instead of the reward so become a uh, negative functions and this can be minimized instead of maximizing the functions in case of distinct action space when there is a finite number of actions uh, actions we we consider a network which takes a states as an input and generate a n output each states q for all a belonging to states and the q as a is obtained by indexing so uh, basically it's uh, the states is, is the input to the network and the uh, output is q as a so which and in, in figure five this network takes states as the input and generates a qa for all possible actions in case of continuous action space the q function is built by network which takes the states s and actions a as an input and generate a single value because we have uh, in case of continuous action space, so the infinite number of actions can be done. So it generates a single value of Q functions as the output. The policy in this state S is given by maximizing the, the arguments. Since we are not interested and neither is possible or, or makes sense in solving the optimization problems in each state, we select the structure for the Q functions such that the optimization problem is carried out analytically. One possible structure for Q functions is given uh, quadratic, which commonly used in linear quadratic control problems. The policy is obtained by mathematically maximizing the quality of Q functions with respect to the actions. Temporal different learning in 
in a queue queue learning algorithm a network possibly deep is built to learn the queue functions in the discrete action space the network take s takes takes a states s as an input and generate the queue functions for all the actions in case of continuous expansion state the network take takes the state s as action and a actions and generate queue functions if this network represented the queue function then it sits right Boltzmann's equations before learning however the network does not uh, represent the queue functions so there will be an error as a result uh, the Boltzmann equation is not satisfied so there is an error so learn the parameters in the network queue to optimize the mean square error for continuous action space and for a quadratic uh, queue uh, function the matrix z is given by the least square temporal distributions instead of least square uh, given by the learn by the least square temporal difference learning uh, case study so how to select the actions so if someone wants to go to a restaurant in the town you can uh, explore explorations means that you can select a random restaurants that you will have never tried before or exploitations mean that you can go to a your favorite restaurants so a good point is that exploit exploitations is that you like what you will eat and the good point about explore exploration is that you might find something that you like than your favorite one with this case study in case of rl the same thing happens if the agents only stick to the exploitation it can never improve the policy and it will get stuck in the local optimal for optimal optimum forever on the other hand if the agents only explores it never uses what it has learned and only tries to random things it it is Im important to balance the level of exploitation and explorations the simplest way to select a to have uh, exploitation and exploration is described here for the discrete and continuous action space. For discrete action space, select a, uh, a level which is more than zero, zero and less than one and select a random number in between zero to one. If this random number is less than the selected level, explore by selecting a random action space, follow the policy and maximize the queue functions. So uh, the action space is a random number. If it is less than our uh, tolerance limit, and, uh, and uh, otherwise we maximize the Q, Q functions. For a smaller uh, tolerance limit, less, less explorations. Same thing in the continuous, in case of continuous action, action space, when the action space is continuous, the actions A is selected from an optimal policy plus some randomness with a Gaussian distributions. And the, uh, the actions are, uh, are um, taken from the maximization of the Q function plus the uh, random number for a small smaller standard deviation less explore excellence q learning as an algorithm so first the network is built or selected to represent the q functions then the network is Im improved iteratively in its iteration of the algorithm the following steps are followed sample the trajectory from the environment to collect data q learning q learning by following these steps initialize the empty history states actions and the reward and the next steps and the dance done is that boolean operator with uh, true or false we observe the state states and select a new actions according to the uh, previous uh, subsections uh, we derive the environment using actions and observe rewards r and the next states of uh, next states as this and the boolean done which is true if it is this episode and otherwise are always false at this stage actions reward and the next step actions uh, next step next stage done in the history best uh, states actions reward next state and done then we continue these steps until the episode changes we use states actions reward next step done to optimize the parameter of the networks how to improve the q learning to be q learning by some simple adjustment the approach is called replay queue learning and it has two additional components in comparison with the queue learning it has a memory and a replay so in the memory we build a memory to save data points throughout the times each time step points are containing the states actions and rewards next steps and the next steps 
uh, and the boolean done which shows if the episodes ended we save all this data and sequentially when the memory is full the older data is removed and the new data are replaces Re replay from learning in for learning instead of using the data from the latest episode we sample from the memory of the best so memory is storing so it stored all the uh, previous steps and when required sampling we take from the memory this way we have more diverse and independent data to learn and it helps us to learn better so q learning uh, replay q learning as an algorithm how to do it first we build a network to represent the q functions in its iteration of the algorithm we do the following we sample a trajectory from the environment to collect data for replay q learning following the steps we observe the state state and select the actions we deviate the environment using the actions observe the rewards and the next states and the boolean then add this to the memory and continue from one one a until the episode ends now improving the how we improve we improve the q networks we sample bats from the memory let uh, this uh, states actions rewards and and are the sample batches we, we supply the this uh, to this uh, variables to the network and optimize the parameter of the new of the network difference between uh, exper uh, experience replay q learning and q learning in the experience replay q learning state action rewards are done are sample from the memory but in in case of q learning they are from the last latest episodes so third part uh, third process is the model building system identification and adaptive control reinforcement learning versus traditional approach in control system adaptive control in rl is about invoking actions which is a con 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 considered as a control of the environment of the systems and taking advantage of the observation of the response to actions to form a better and better actions on the environments. So this diagram shows a model model building a process. So how it is, it sees an environment or a system as a map from the measured input U to a measured output Y, build a mathematical model of the systems from U to U to Y by some uh, identification techniques. The process could be programmed in time so each time steps, the model, uh, each time step T, a model uh, theta T is available. Upon uh, decision, upon uh, a desired goal from the control system, like the output, this should follow a given reference signals. Find a good control uh, solutions for the goal. Uh, in case of system uh, in the Skype, uh, the model in the theta star is equal to the input and the hypothesis of the theta star and yt where yt denotes the all the outputs up to the time steps use a policy use a control policy to update the u system now second method is system identification. system identification is about building a mathematical model of the system based on observation of input and output they have three main ingredient the observed data uh, this is the y is the output and the u is the inputs the model structure M, a parametric set of candidates model from M theta. Its model allows a prediction of the next output based on the earlier data. Uh, it is predicted with a function of T, theta, and Z. An identification method from maps from the, uh, this input Z to M uh, output, uh, model M. So on numerical examples, a simple common model of uh, system identification ARM model where uh, all outputs are equal to the some uh, some function of all the inputs with coefficient b. So natural uh, the natural prediction for this model is y t is equal to uh, psi n theta. The natural uh, identification method is to minimize the least square error between the measured output y and the model output y bar. So uh, this is the minimization problems, the solutions given by this. And then in case of recursive system identification, the model can be calculated recursively in time so that it is updated anytime new measured because become available. Rearranging the previous uh, equations in its times, these equations become these equations. At time t, we just only have a uh, have to keep the uh, theta bar t and the rt in the memory. 
this is uh, the recursive least square least square methods the updating difference updating difference yt minus uh, psi psi transpose and uh, phi transpose t is equal to yt yt and uh, y bar uh, y uh, Y uh, Y predicted T with uh, condition with theta uh, T minus one. The updation is thus derived by the current model errors. Many uh, variation of recursive model is estimation can be developed for various model structure, but uh, the uh, recursively square method is intended to archetype archetype for the all recursive uh, identification methods. Recursive identification and policy gradient method in RL. Uh, there is an important concept, if not formal, between the recursive uh, recursive uh, least square and the policy gradient. We can think of the reward in the system identification to a minimization expectation model error variance j expect with j is equal to expectation of the error, where error is given by y t minus uh, the predicted uh, predicted y, or a maximize maximize the negative value of it. The policy would corresponding to the model parameter theta to maximize the reward with respect to the policy would be mean to make adjustment guided by the gradients. For identification reward, uh, this gradients, uh, the gradients without the expectation becomes a, this uh, j and uh, without this expectation. So two times of uh, the epsilon and the psi, which is become two types of two times of the uh, actual value and the predicted value. Uh, for the RM model, the psi is equal to per psi. So the updated of least square, li, li, recursive least square is given by the gradient, reward gradient. In this way, the recursive, uh, recursive method can be interpreted as a policy gradient method. In the appendix, they have done uh, two problems, the card pool problems and the linear quadratic problem. And they have done uh, the card pool problem with three methods: the policy gradient, Q learning, and replay Q learning. In case of the linear quadratic problem, linear quadratic problem, policy gradient, and uh, Q learning algorithm is considered. And they have uh, they have, and uh, all the codes. Can you tell us what they do for the card pool? Yeah, well, uh, so, uh, hello. Yes. So, yeah. what, so they have, what they have uh, done actually they have this is for a uh, discrete action space so they are using policy gradient in the card pro and q learning in 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 the uh, discrete action space actually so so what, I, what, what is the action the movement uh, the, movement, the part, movement of the card actually numerical part i have not completed oh, okay no problem in uh, here actually they have given the entire quote and the examples Yeah, here they have actually provided all the three, all the three example, two examples with the Python codes. Yeah, uh, uh, I had a question. So in the replay queue learning, they define a particular memory which is replaced after it gets full, right? Yes, yes. So, so is there any rule or or any guideline they follow, like what? should be the minimum memory that they require for proceeding in the theory part they have not discussed this part numerical part uh, i have not studied that part the coding part but in the theory part they have not discussed how much memory is required oh, okay thank you 
let me just say a random comment from working in adaptive control a hundred years ago. There is, a, I mean, it's, it, the ideas are very comparable ideas, but they were done in a much simpler way. So this has to do with your question about the memory. So the point is, if you do well to, in your task, then the system is going to spend a lot of time close to the successful state. And as you spend a lot of time close to the successful state, you kind of, uh, if you have finite memory, you forget the previous history and you don't know anymore what is going to happen if a bad perturbation comes in. And so a very typical thing in adaptive control that I presume will also happen here is something that they call bursting. You do well for some time, you come close to what you want, you spend a good time close to what you want, and then a little noise comes in and boom, you go away because exactly you didn't have enough memory and all the data from recent history are in a nice regime. I, I hope what I say is re relevant. It just asked about the memory. And I wanted to say that this issue of forgetting and how much you remember can lead to instabilities in such problems. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get the idea. Thank you. Any more questions for our speakers? Um, uh, uh, Gishan, let me uh, sort of mean like yeah. Gishan presented um, a uh, reinforcement learning, I think, last year also to the group. Um, uh, kind of review. <clears throat> Is there anything new in this paper, Gishan, compared to what you presented at the time? Uh, I think. I think uh, Kamal will cover more like the deep learning uh, re related part. Did and, you do the uh, Q learning at the time? Did you present the Q learning? No, I just present some like a uh, like conventional reinforcement learning. Like the, yeah. Do you have any comments on like sort of deep learning offline, deep learning, deep, deep learning, reinforcement learning offline? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, actually offline uh, reinforcement learning is really uh, gaining popularity recently, especially in 2020. Uh, the lab at UC Berkeley uh, called, led, led by the surgery Levin, uh, their group was focusing on like a re uh, offline reinforcement learning and uh, the offline re reinforcement learning is a algorithm because so Camo presented the uh, on mo mo most of the algorithms are online where the the trained agent is interacting with the environment. Uh, well, um, offline reinforcement learning tends to use the like a uh, um, history of uh, like of the the pair of state actions that uh, when an agent collect, you can have a history of the observation and actions. So offline means that I, I don't uh, interact, the agent does not interact with the environment uh, in the training set. So that makes the, um, the cost of uh, like, a, the benefit is like, a, for example, for medical medical problems, um, we we don't need to have a patient, which uh, which may be harmful because if your your agent is not very uh, performing very well, it will uh, prescribe actions uh, that that is that is uh, not very helpful to the uh, to the to from to the to the patients. So uh, one is safety concern, like you don't because you don't interact with the environment. And the second is uh, uh, the cost is is less because uh, in some like a mechanical problem or like a large uh, robotics problem, you have to interact with uh, you have to interact with the environment, and it's really costly in terms of uh, time and uh, money. And but yeah, but, but yes, and in your thesis, I. Can you say mm -hmm. something about your thesis? Like, are you doing this for the insulin problem? Yeah, yeah. Can you say something to so people can know know about it? Oh yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so currently we are using a uh, using a Ohio T1D data set, which records the patient's um, blood glucose and uh, insulin prescriptions uh, to, as, as a offline data set. And our goal is because um, our problem set up because uh, insulin will affect glucose and, uh, and the glucose we want to maintain it within a safe range, uh, which is above uh, 80 milligram per deliter to like uh, the best is 100, uh, like uh, 180 uh, milligram per deliter. So the pr uh, precise prescription of the insulin will affect uh, later on glu glucose of patients. And we trying to use this offline data set to train a uh, automatic, uh, like automatic uh, insulin dosage system, which also termed as art artificial pancreas to uh, provide the patients with a safe control of the blood glucose. So this is a case where you have clinical data or databases, public databases. So, so it's in that case, you want to do offline deep learning, yeah. right? Because you will not have lots of states to observe. Yeah, I don't have like occasions. In the, in yeah. the online, the online um, reinforcement learning that. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So ideally we, 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 we were best to have a patient, but that's really expensive and not very safe to interact with. So we used a, a, a metabolism um, OD system to model the actual state of the patients. Probably if uh, in the future, we can replace the OD model with like a mouse model because I feel that's kind of safe. It's like I don't know, a pig. Uh, anybody else has any parting thoughts on reinforcement learning, any experiences, any recommendations? I, I, I have a very naive uh, question. Um, okay, so in principle, what you learn is an algorithm. You see, in this case, you learn a control algorithm from the cart. Has anybody ever figured out in the end that the algorithm learned by reinforcement learning is very close to or far away from or one to one to model predictive control, linear quadratic regulators? Like, right? If, if, the end of a reinforcement learning exercise is to learn a process, so to learn an algorithm for the task. Okay. So, is is there somewhere a thought or a comparison of here is what here is the here is the here is the algorithm I learned with reinforcement learning uh, to find steady state? Here is Newton. They are close to each other. They are different from each other. Something. Sorry, it's a naive thought, but I, I wanted to ask. Maybe somebody has read some discussion about this. Lulu, do you know if there is validation like that? In any of in any of these uh, algorithms, uh, I'm not quite sure. Do, do I make sense though, Lulu? Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, you learn an algorithm. Mm. So, it, so it's interesting to compare this algorithm to established algorithms for the same problem. Yeah. Okay, that, that's the thought. We can talk about it some other time. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, may I add on that uh, because. I'm not sure, like the evaluation, you, you, you mean how to evaluate the reinforcement learning algorithm. Well, but in the end, you get a subroutine, which is a policy, right? Which you will apply yeah. to a new pro. Okay, that's what, I mean, that's what an algorithm is. It's some, you know, you want to control the cart, somebody gives you an algorithm. Mm -hmm. so, so there is established algorithms, and then there is the algorithm that you found with reinforcement learning. It, it would be interesting to think of these two, you know, procedures and see are they one-to-one -one with each other are they completely qualitatively different you know okay yeah but just a thought uh yeah so uh i th i think because it's like a i i, I mean from my experience with the, yeah. the project so far i would say i i can't uh, like uh talk about it in the evaluation part we we when you evaluate algorithm you interact with the system but you can also say because we i have a offline uh, reinforcement uh, like say offline data set so i have the observation or history and i can uh apply apply the same uh history to the learned algorithm to see 
if actually the uh, the output is better than what I collected in the offline data set. If for example, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Yanis. This is Panos. Yeah, hi, Panos. Not bad. Uh, yes. Uh, so, what Q learning, for example, and other methods do in reinforcement learning is that they they try to solve the the Bellman equation. So yes, you can you can show you know that uh, if you let it run for infinite time, eventually it will it will train and solve the Bellman equation. So yeah. if you want a comparison, you have to compare it with other methods that try to solve. The Bellman equation. So I, I understand. I mean, in the yeah. Bellman equation, you 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 have some optimality. So you find something that is optimal with respect to some cost. I guess exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you have to compare it with other methods which try to solve for the same optimality principle. Yeah, I, I hear you. But it, yeah. I, and and you're right in this. But again, what I'm saying is, if you have, even if they are not optimizing the same problem to see if you got the same solution right uh -huh. it, it still would be interesting to see whether the algorithms are one-to-one -one with each other like you know that that they you can map but, trajectories of the one to trajectories of the other yes and that's what i'm saying i don't know if yeah. you can actually do that but you can say that this algorithm is trying to satisfy this optimality principle so yeah. you have that, to that is also it. interesting yes so but, what but, is, I, yeah. but i don't know if the solutions that you get the, like you said, the policy is actually a solution of the Bellman equation. Do you actually, is if there is one to one? So okay, I, 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 but, yeah. but but it, it, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, how could one test? I mean, you know, can, can we create, let's say, a, a transformation that takes the thing learned by reinforcement learning and map it? Or, you know, where is it? The, no, no big deal. I, I I understand. I think what you're saying. Right, right but I, I I don't know if there is a one to one of or because it is an optimality principle. If there are multiple solutions that satisfy this, yeah, the I same optimality principle, like having an energy landscape with many minima that that have the same value, but Look, you at, find yeah at, at a much simpler level. The, the the fixed point, you know, the, the control fixed point will have some basin of attraction. What's okay. the basin of attraction for an LQR? And what's the basin of attraction for the Q learned uh, thing? You know, there's some, well, some for, basic for, measures. For, for LQR, exactly because it's quadratic, things are simpler, right? So you have convexity. But for yeah. the Q learning, that's the difficulty there. And that's why all this replay and everything else was developed because when you try to solve the Bellman equation in a naive way, it's unstable. So, yeah. so especially, especially, this, yeah. especially if you introduce deep neural networks to represent the action value and the policy, etc. There are no guarantees there that that these things will actually, you know, converge. Okay. So that 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 that's why. All these methods, when they were used by by Google to get these spectacular results, they are very brittle. Okay. And when people try to use them after you know Google's Nature papers, etc., uh, they had a lot of trouble. I mean, I I tried using them some of those myself, and I had to do all sorts of tricks to stabilize them. Okay, yeah, I don't have a sense of this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good. Hi, come on. I have an, an, another a naive question. So, uh, um, so I'm thinking, what is the current limitation uh, for applying this uh, reinforcement learning in, in in a real world application? Let's say uh, a medical application. So, does it come from the evaluation of your environment, or um, uh, that, that uh, or or uh, you need a better algorithms or a framework to uh, improve this. Uh, mm, I'm not so. sure what the paper doesn't discuss all this actually. It's only a limited scope of the paper. I see. Okay, uh, is there any more questions for our speaker? Well, if not, uh, thanks for the great discussion uh, and also thanks for the excellent talk. Um, okay, so our next speaker is uh, Xuhui Meng. Uh, Xuhui is a postdoc in our uh, crunch group. So um, today he's going to give us a talk with the title, Data-Driven Discovery of Governing Equations for Fluid Dynamics Based on Molecular Simulations. I think this um, 
um, paper review um, gives us, um, uh, will show us some results about uh, what we can learn using um, microscopic data. So um, please join me and welcome our second speaker. Xu Hui, you may start. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So thank you for the introduction. And today I'm going to uh, review a paper data driven discovery of government equations for the dynamics based on molecular simulation. And this paper was published uh, in GFM last year, and uh, both authors are from China, Beihang University, China. And uh, before <laughs> going to the paper, I will introduce some backgrounds for this paper. So the first background is uh, gas flow reg regimes. And uh, we can divide the gas flow into different regimes uh, based on the closed number. Uh, here, the closed number is defined as the ratio between uh, mean free path, mean free, uh, mean free path um, for the particles and the characteristic length of the flow channel, for example, here each. And in general, we have four uh, different regimes for the gas flow, the continuous, uh, continuum, continuum uh, regime, snip flow, uh, snip regime, and transitional uh, regime, and free molecular regime. And uh, we can use different uh, models to describe the flows, uh, the flows in different regimes. For example, the, uh, for example, in the continuum, uh, continuum regime, we can use uh, uh, we can uh, at the microscopic uh, uh, microscopic scale we can use the Boltzmann equation, and at the macroscopic uh, scale we can use the navier stokes equations. And the solutions from these two uh, from these two models are the same. Uh, on the same or uh, equivalent regarding the uh, macroscopic properties, say the, the pressure, density, and the velocity. And uh, for example, here, I for the cavity flow here, I, I use the, the Lex Boltzmann method, which is a uh, which is a solver for a simplified Boltzmann equation. And I also use uh, and I also have results from the lecta, which is a solver for the Navier Stokes equation. And this is a relative to error between the solutions from these two uh, solvers from or models. And then they are very close, they are very, they are very, very similar. And uh, in general, uh, we, uh, in general, the, the micro, uh, solving the microscopic uh, microscopic uh, models is more expensive than the, than the, than the microscopic models. And uh, And the second background is, uh, is about the upscaling and downscaling. As I mentioned, we can use two uh, different models to describe the flows uh, at the microscopic uh, scale and the microscopic uh, scale. So from, at the microscopic scale, what we get is the, is the molecular dynamics and say the, the particle allocation and all the trajectories of particles. So that, and uh, at the microscopic scale, we'll get the uh, the density and the velocity of the of the of the, of the, of the fluids, and uh, when we get the, uh, the the particle dynamics in the, at the microscopic uh, scale, we can take the we can compute the we can get the microscopic uh, uh, microscopic uh, properties like the density and the velocity uh, by taking the average of the particles. Say this is the mass of the particle, and this is the the the, the Volume of the of the of the uh, yeah, cell, and we can compute the density like this, and we can, and this is the particle velocity, and this is the number of the particle you use to uh, compute the microscopic microscopic uh, velocity, and this uh, if we if we have the uh, particle dynamics, uh, the particle dynamics at the microscopic uh, scale, and uh, we get the, we compute the microscopic as uh, microscopic properties uh, using the, the the microscopic properties. This is called upscaling. And if you have the microscopic uh, properties like the uh, density and the velocity, we, we try to recover the, the, the particle dynamics at a micro, my, uh, microscopic uh, scale. This is called downscaling. And in general, the upscaling, the solution for the upscaling is unique. But for the downscaling, the, the, say if we have the microscopic properties, we try to recover the uh, particle dynamics. The solution is quite unique, and uh, we have we also have two papers in our uh, in our group on this topic using pins. The first one is from Xiaoling Chen, 
and the uh, installation on the upscaling, and the second one is uh, from Miu Yang uh, on the downscaling. So for the first uh, in the first paper, uh, at a microscopic scale, the uh, the the uh, the governing equation at the microscopic uh, scale is the stochastic uh, differentiate uh, differentiate equation. Here x is the location of the particle, and this is the convection time, and these two are diffusion uh, diff diffusive terms. And at the microscopic uh, microscopic uh, scale, the governing equation is for the density function p here, and a is some a star is some operator, and this is the initial condition for the uh, density function, and uh, they assume that uh, they have some unknown parameters or unknown terms in uh, microscopic, uh, microscopic uh, uh, governing equations. And given some snapshots of the particle trajectories, they try to recover and they try to infer the unknown parameters at a microscopic uh, uh, scale. And uh, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, the use of uh, the use uh, neural talk as a surrogate model for the density function, and this is the a governing equation for the uh, for the uh, microscopic governing equations, and this is a loss for the data, and this is actually in the same as in pins. So we have the loss for the PD, and we also have the data. But now the data is from the microscopic uh, uh, and the data from the microscopic properties, and and uh, in this way they try to uh, discover the the unknown parameters in uh, for the uh, microscopic uh, uh, governing equations, and uh, the second the second paper. And at a, at a microscopic uh, uh, scale, the governing equation is like taken like this, and L is some operator. And uh, at a microscopic scale, uh, this is a governing equation for the particles, which is also a stochastic, uh, a stochastic differentiation, uh, differentiation equation. This is a, a convection term, and this is a diffusion term. And uh, in this paper, let's assume that they have uh, also measurements or observations. Uh, on the microscopic properties like a density here, and they and they have some unknown parameters in the governing equations at a microscopic scale, and they try to use the measurements on the microscopic scale to recover uh, to recover the dynamic and to uh, particle dynamics or to infer the unknown parameters in the governing equation at the microscopic scale. This is the downscaling. And then let's go back to this paper. So as I just mentioned, and uh, so this is the, uh, the different regimes for the gas flow. And uh, as we can see, the Navier Stokes equation only covers a very small range of the closed numbers here. But for the Boltzmann, but, but at the microscopic scale, the Boltzmann equation can cover a wide range of flow regimes. And uh, for the continuous flow, we can use the uh, Navier Stokes equation, but for the Flows in this regime, we don't have uh, very exact uh, or very accurate continuum and uh, macroscopic uh, governing equations. Uh, in this paper, they propose to uh, ger to generate data to solve the uh, to solve the governing equation at a microscopic scale to get a solution for the at a microscopic scale, and then they try to discover the governing equation at the microscopic scale. And in this, in this paper, they use the direct simulation on the column method to solve the Boltzmann equation to get a solution. And to get a solution for the density and also uh, velocity. And then they try to uh, discover the governing equations at the microscopic scale. And will generalize the Navier-Stokes equation. And uh, they do this because uh, generally uh, solving the, the, the model at the microscopic scale is more expensive than the, uh, the microscopic microscopic uh, models. So if we can get a very accurate uh, microscopic model and we, for the later use, and it will, it will be more efficient. And to determine the governing equations in at the microscopic based on the microscopic properties, and uh, they, they assume that the uh, Common equation at a microscopic is as follows, and the n is some operator, and the operator and uh, you can see here is the coefficients for different uh, different terms for the right hand side, and then they use they use a, a candidate library for different operators here, and uh, in this paper they this uh, this all the uh, candidate uh, term uh, operators they used in the, in this paper. And our objective now is to, given the 
uh, so given the uh, data from the, so we can first solve the, use the microscopic solver to solve the Boltzmann equation to get a data. And then given the data, we try to find the optimal coefficients for each operator here. And uh, the, the loss function, we use the following loss function to get the optimal uh, coefficients here, C. And the first term is the loss for the data, and we also have uh, we also have uh, regularization, L2 regularization for the coefficients to make it sparse. And uh, here, for different, uh, uh, for the for operators in the right hand side, we have uh, we have different uh, uh, orders of uh, derivatives. They use a finite difference to compute the derivatives. And uh, they have uh, three examples in the, in the paper. And the first one is. Uh, it's for the shear flow using uh, for the argon gas. And this is the pressure and temperature and the number of the number of dense particle density in used in the simulation. And uh, the combinational domain is a square domain and the length is uh, 100 times uh, mean free path. So the close number here is uh, 1, uh, 0.01. And this is the correct characteristic uh, time. And this is the mean velocity of the particles. And they divide the in the simulations, they divide the whole communication domain into 256 uh, by 256 uh, uniform cells. And in each cell, they have, uh, they have uh, 4,000 molecules. And uh, this is the initial condition for the velocity. And, and, to, they, and for, the, for each particle, they impose the velocity at the initial, uh, initial time. That's the, uh, in the given velocity uh, plus some um, random thermal velocity. And the time, uh, time step used in the DSMC is uh, 0.1 tau. And uh, they, they use the, they use turn, turn, they use the, this is the time, uh, time interval they use the to compute the, the compute the microscopic velocity based on the particles. And this is the, time, the window used to, and the window in the space used to take, to compute the, Velocity at the to based on the particle particles, and then this is a total computational time, and uh, so in total they will have a one hundred snapshots. So they will use one hundred snapshots to 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 discover the graph equation at the microscopic uh, microscopic scale. And this is the exact graph equation they use to they use uh, for reference, and this is a viscosity. Which can be determined by the mean free path and the mean velocity of the particles, which is about a uh, 0.0, which is about a uh, 0.44 uh, line. And uh, since we use the particles to compute the velocity and density at a microscopic scale, and uh, it's it will get some fluctuation in uh, in the estimation. So the the estimation error is, uh, is as follows, and then is the number of the particles you use to compute the velocity in, at a microscopic scale. And uh, the Mach number is, uh, is the ratio between uh, the, velocity, the velocity and the mean, uh, mean particle velocity. And this is the number of the particles they use to compute the velocity and density in, in this paper, and the error is about 0.03. And this is the discovered the carbon equation. Which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, very accurate for this case, and they also try to reduce the particles used to estimate the uh, velocity. And uh, as we can see, as they decrease the number of particles in computing the velocity, the error for the velocity will increase. And uh, this is the error for for the discover uh, uh, equation or the, the constant here. And uh, the combinational error for the for the estimated governing equation will also increase. And if the computational error in in estimation in estimation of the velocity is uh, is around point one uh, percent, we cannot find the direct and correct uh, governing equation. And the second problem is a diffusion problem. And uh, this is the initial condition for two species in the in the square domain here. And, and for this case, they use the same uh, setup as the previous case, and the velocity is zero, so it's just a, a pure diffusion problem. And this is the reference uh, the reference solution for the for the microscopic uh, gamma equation, and this is the diffusion coefficient. 
And uh, this is the discard the governor equation, which is very close to like that solution. And last, last example is the Taylor gray vortex. And uh, the computation domain is also a uh, uh, square domain and, uh, and use the uh, periodic boundary conditions for all the boundaries. And uh, the flow can be described by incompressible uh, navier stokes equation here. And the based on the governing equation, navier stokes equation, you can get the vorticity governing equation here. And then they try to uh, discover the, the, the governing equation for the uh, vorticities here. And uh, the, the computational domain is, div uh, is divided into 64 by 64 uniform cells. And each cell uses uh, this number of the molecules. And the initial condition for the velocity is here. And the, the computational domain size is uh, 200 times the mean free path. And time steps is also 0.1 tau. And uh, they, use this, uh, they use the particles in this time interval to compute the, the velocity at a microscopic scale. And the total computational time is uh, 650 tau, uh, which means they have uh, 65 stop shorts. For, uh, for, so for what's the Knudsen yeah. number? The Knudsen number is zero here. No, it's uh, so the Knudsen number is. Uh, oh yeah, it's one, one over, over one. Hundred. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still a continuous regime. Um, right. Yeah. So um, using this number of the molecules in a cell, this is the. Uh, this is the conditional error. The boundary, for, sorry, the boundary conditions are not. The boundary conditions are sleep. Because lambda um, over L is one over two hundred. Yeah, maybe a very 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 small thing for sleep velocity, but here they just use a periodic boundary conditions. So, oh, so they avoid they avoid the issue. Yeah, yeah, yes. And and this is the computational error for using a particle to estimate the, the velocity, and uh, this is the discovery governing equation, and this is the exact governing equation. So the computational errors for the for the unknown parameters in the governing equation is about uh, six uh, six percent here. And that's all in this paper. And uh, so this is the summary. And uh, they use the DSMC to generate to generate the data and all the solution the for the microscopic governing equation, and try to use the the the, the the solution to discover the microscopic governing equation. But all the test cases are uh, in the continuous regime or very near, very close to the continuous regime, which is not very interesting. And uh, here are some comments on this paper. So I think we can use the pins to, uh, to do like that, uh, to do exactly the uh, same thing for in this paper. And the advantage of, of pins is first, uh, in PINs, we use the automatic differentiation to compute the derivatives of the solution. But in this paper, they use a final difference to compute the to compute the derivative uh, di to approximate the derivatives. Because the the the, 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 the solution is from the particle method, so you you get some fluctuation or noise in the in the data in the, in the velocity, as I showed in here. If the velocity has a uh, one percent error, they cannot get a correct, a correct, uh, uh, correct. Uh, they cannot, they can, they cannot uh, discover the correct uh, gamma equation at a microscopic scale. But in PINs, since we use, we are using the uh, automatic differentiation, so we can tolerate larger noise in in estimating the the, the derivative. And second advantage of PINs is uh, the measurement can be arbitrary, but if we use the Final difference, as in this paper, to uh, to approximate the uh, like derivative, we cannot use arbitrary measurements for the accuracy. If we use arbitrary measurements in the final difference, uh, we will get a uh, say very low accuracy. And uh, the last one is, uh, I think, it's uh, more interesting to discover uh, equations beyond the lavier stokes equations. Say the close number is ninety nine point one. But in this paper, the the largest uh, close number is uh, 0.01, so it's very close to the continuum regime, or it's actually in a continuum regime. It's uh, not very interesting. Um, yeah, that's uh, what about this paper. We well, am surprised that it was published in JFM. It's it's really um, yeah, it's very simple. Pretty simple. Can't believe that. Uh... 
that the public uh, uh, they promised the generalized Navier Stokes, but they never done that. They just recover the diffusion equations and the uh... yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, this is a very simple, simplified uh, Navier Stokes equation here. That's can't believe that. I mean, Nathan yeah, just... has done this type of stuff uh, a long time ago, and lots of people are doing it. I think one also is doing this type of identification. It's all this regression that with lasso and so on. That's yeah, nothing, yeah, yeah. There. Was, nothing uh, there actually. Yeah, in the introduction, they mentioned uh, they can use the Nash nice notion from the microscopic solver to uh, discover the equations beyond the Lavis Stokes equation, but in the examples, they don't show any results like that. But also the, to generate the data, Lattice Boltzmann is valid in that regime. Because here, the Lattice um, Boltzmann is... In your paper, you had Lattice Boltzmann running at um, uh, Knudsen number 10. Uh, no, no, this, this is not, not a Lattice Boltzmann. It's, uh, we use a final, uh, final volume-based uh, uh, method to solve a, uh, a basic equation, not Lattice Boltzmann. Lattice Boltzmann only... Uh, can only be applied for the continuous regime and the snippet regime. Okay, yeah, yeah. You could use that. You could use your method instead of DSMC. DSMC is unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. Lots of noise. I we used that in the 90s. Yes. Oh, by the way, so for the last mm -hmm. comment in your last slide, so actually yeah. there's the paper by I think Sun Hao actually already did this, basically combining the pings with the sparse regression. Then oh, I see. I see. For these topics there, but they didn't have the molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, Which paper, yeah, Lulu? Which paper is that? Uh, yeah, by Sun Hao. Basically, you use combining ping and the sparse regression for identification. So everything is the same, but replacing the final difference with the ping. Okay. Mm. And it seems to work well. Yeah, I think uh, it's uh, very straightforward to use pins mm. in this, uh, on, uh, for this for this problem. But the point mm. is, is, I think uh, what's meaningful is, can we try to uh, use the uh, solution from a microscopic scale to find a governing equation, a microscopic scale here, which is beyond the Lavier Stokes equation? And this will be more interesting. Yes, I agree. So, um, for the yeah. distance, for the uh, neutral number beyond point one, do you think we can um, find a PDE for the for that regime? Um, Otherwise, is it China? Because I know some bilat uh, or bilat or say bilat equation, which can be applied for uh, some regime, some for the some close numbers here, beyond uh, larger than point one. But I'm not sure if we can use pins to find some uh, discover some common equations like this here in this in this regime. But if you can find a like continue model for it, then it, it's not continuing. Any it's continue, it becomes a continuum, right? But in reality, it's the continuous assumption is not valid there. So. Yeah, we may, we may need to use some, uh, say, a generalized number Stokes equation or something like that. I think in this regime, it's, uh, uh, it's not totally uh, not continuous here, but for the uh, free molecular regime, yeah. This may be you, a problem. You can think of uh, having like an unknown constitutive law, and you write this as a divergence of the stresses, right? And then you find, for example, what is that strain rate mm -hmm. and stresses from the data. So that will be, that will generalize the diffusion part. That will uh, and then oh, you yes, yes. The, yeah, you leave the advection part uh, as is. Yanis uh, uh, sent me before he signed off the a paper that he wrote with uh, Shujun Lee, our former. Crutch member, uh, he just published, a, uh, I guess a paper was published on coarse scale PDs from fine scale observations via machine learning. So we can invite uh, Shu Jin to um, give us another talk on this. 
So, so they're using um, Gaussian processes, artificial neural networks, and diffusion maps to um, have the relation between the relevant microscopic space fields and their time evolution and so on. So um, this looks more interesting than, um, uh, and, and they are looking at reaction transport, reaction transport actually processes, transport and reaction, yeah. Any more comments from um, our audience? Anybody knows any good downsampling methods? That's the tricky part. To, to, to do averages is, uh, <laughs> is easy. How do you go from a lot, yes. from, from a few to a lot? Yeah, this is the first paper I, I saw someone uh, using blunt to fill the downscaling, yeah. get a very good results for downscaling part. Okay. So, so what you need to do is to do something like that, but also what uh, Jen Jan is uh, with uh, Shin are doing to, to uh, impose also uh, structure preserving, like for example, the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So you cannot arbitrarily do that, you know, for physical systems, not for, this is for, there's no, no conservation laws here, but for conservation laws, you have to do something else. For physical, okay. like yeah, Navier Stokes and so on. Just a curiosity: is the downsampling problem can be formulated in a way of like row selection problem? What selection? Sorry, Young John. Row selection. So suppose that I'm wondering if the downsampling problem might be uh, formulated in a way that suppose you have a long Matrix, so you overdetermine the large matrix, and somehow downsampling can be corresponding to the selecting rows. No, no, it's, no it's not. It's not like that. It's not like that. It's because, look, you you want to, <laughs> you want to have the right correlations in the fluctuations, right? Let's right, say, right. let's say that let's say the uh, microscopic system has a certain correlation length, and of course, the real system don't have just one correlation length; they have multiple correlation lengths. You know, because it's a heterogeneous. That's an impossible problem. You cannot just solve it by just uh, throwing out data or, you know. The, uh, yeah, so you have to have this consistency. But even for a single, imagine you, you, I mean, if you have a single, we're trying to do like that when we, because when you do multi scale modeling, right, you go from continuum to atomistic. And there's this buffer region and you have to overlap. So you have to take the continuum to give some microscopic information to the atomistic. And that has to be consistent with the right correlation length. Otherwise you introduce mm. uh, erroneous fluctuations. You feed continuously the atomistic system. So they have to be consistent in the sense that at least the correlation length matches. So you can set up a, you know, a, 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 stock, a, a GP, let's say, Krieg, like a Krieging there to, to introduce. But, uh, but another, basically we need to, learn how to generate, I mean, guns could, could work actually to generate, um, you know, certain distributions, let's say, you know, fluctuation with certain distributions. But again, that's not unique, like um, yeah. what uh, Shuhui said. So, so that's really interesting because it's, it's an open problem, I think. People have sort of faked it. There is some, uh, from Marcos Katsulakis, there's some, um, the icing model that he did some work with Maida on the icing model on how to do that. But that's very, very simple. As it's a little more rigorous. But... Right, maybe, uh, Minlang, maybe you can finish to, today early. Yep, yep, uh, since we, uh... Uh, we end our seminar before two, so uh, I'll follow up on a uh, on the link of this um, uh, of this recording of this seminar. So everybody have a good weekend and take care. Bye. Bye bye.